Good morning and welcome to Silk Life Online and happy Easter. It's our delight to have you with us here this morning. Hopefully you're aware that Easter Sunday is all about the resurrection of Jesus. Forgive me for stating the blazingly obvious there, but it's helpful to make sure that we're all at the same point before we start. The resurrection is the exclamation point of all history. But sadly, it can too easily shrink in our view to some sort of triviality or afterthought, maybe even somehow irrelevant or just confusing. But I would ask you this, how, how could it possibly be irrelevant if the man Jesus, who had, by the way, previously claimed to be God, if this man actually did rise from the dead, how could it possibly ever be irrelevant? How could it possibly not matter? Jesus was killed on the cross and laid in a borrowed tomb. It had belonged to Joseph of Arimathea and sin and death appeared to have won. I can't imagine the scenes on that first Easter Sunday morning, the first returning breaths in the lungs of Jesus, the first flinching muscles, the first thoughts. I wonder, did he rise with a start as if the cross had been, been a hideous nightmare and, and yet no, it had been real. He had been dead. I, I hope I fully expect that it was nothing like me trying to get out this morning, dragging my sorry backside over the side of the mattress. It was a, a sight not to behold. I can't imagine the first shards of light as the, as the stone was rolled back by angelic hosts. I wonder which was brighter, the morning sun or the radiance of the angels. I fancy the shone that's I say, I fancy that the, the sun shone maybe, maybe brighter than normal that morning, as, as, as the whole of creation stood to attention at the triumphant rising of the Lord of the cosmos. I can't imagine the, the first awareness of the Roman guards that something was, was not quite right. Their first awareness that the body of Jesus was somehow gone and the, the blame and accusation thrown back and forth between them as they realized that they were in trouble. I can't imagine how helpless they were in, in confusion, realizing that they were powerless to stand in the way of the divine agenda unfolding that morning. Christians, we, we must repeatedly return to the empty tomb. No matter how much it challenges our worldview, our understanding of biology and science, no matter how much the world around us sneers saying dead people don't come back to life, we must keep revisiting it with the same awe and trepidation and confusion of the early disciples. Jesus isn't afraid of our questions. And I imagine there are angels still scratching their heads trying to work it out. But like the early disciples, we must encounter the risen Jesus and allow that encounter to fuel us into worship. The resurrection is the great rise after the tortuous plunge of the cross. You see, Jesus didn't just invade his own creation and make camp among humanity as a man but he plunged to the bottom of that dark dark seemingly bottomless abyss of slavery to sin guilt and shame not to surrender to it but to purchase freedom to pay a ransom and every step of Jesus's breathtaking life took him closer and closer to this moment inevitably driving towards Jerusalem, towards a cultural clash with the ruling authorities and the religious leaders, inevitably towards the brutal punishment of the cross. You'll remember the scene, crucify him, crucify him, mocking voices, yelling out, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. But realize this, 
at any moment, Jesus could have saved himself. He could have called on a host of angels to rescue himself and silence the mockers. And yet he pushed on. Further down, he plunged into an ocean of suffering. Down, down, down into depths of darkness unknown to men or angels. And at the bottom, where all is blackest, we heard his cry. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when he gave his final gasp, all of heaven went silent. And for three long days, the waters stood still. Creation held its breath and his disciples wept. But on the morning of the third day, ripples crept across the water. And from the unseen bottoms, he rose. It was not possible for him to be held by the pangs of death. And there was no tomb that could hold him as heaven erupts and graves open the lamb who took away the sins of men further than the east is from the west returned. And this means everything. If Jesus had remained swallowed in the grave, the cry of it is finished was just an admission of tragic surrender. But the resurrection is indispensable for any confidence of forgiveness. Jesus died and stayed dead, then our faith is futile. It isn't finished. He might be finished, but the bigger picture is not. We are still in our sins, still drowning in it. But Jesus rose, and so it is finished. And so, friends, when the voice of accusation or condemnation points you to your sin, seeking to crush you with, with guilt and shame, telling you that you're not good enough, that you're not worthy, that you're not clean enough, that you're a disgrace, point that voice back to the empty tomb and quote Romans 8, you cannot condemn me because Christ Jesus, the one who died, the one who was raised, the one who is now at the right hand of God, he is interceding for me. He knows my name and it is finished. He is on my team. I'm on his. I belong to him. I'm his plus one. There is no separating us because Jesus rose, because the tomb is empty. Think this through. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he is alive and he is with us through every circumstance of our lives. The children of God too often forget that their elder brother lives. We see him active in the past, in the pages of the Bible. And, and in the pages of the Bible, we see a description of more to come. But we can struggle to find him in the moment by moment. Maybe we, we don't recognize him, not, not as the risen Lord, not now. He's not merely the one who was and the one who will be, but he is the, the one who is because he is alive. We find it easy to worship at the bloody cross, easy to worship at the filled tomb. We, we memorialize a fallen hero like, a, like an 11th of November experience. We grieve. We feel the sense of unworthiness. We mourn the, the tragic sacrifice. We linger there in the poignancy of the, of the shameful cross. Do you know, sometimes in our sorrow and in the strains of our circumstances or our oh, every day in the routine of our nine till five, our sickness, our anxiety, our depression, sometimes Jesus draws near, but we're like Mary at the tomb. We can mistake Jesus for the kindly gardener. The one who comes alongside and takes sympathy on us, but is largely powerless 
to change our circumstances. We can act as if the tombstone still blocks our way to Jesus, but it doesn't because the stone is rolled away. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. What did the kindly gardener say to Mary? Wasn't a kindly gardener. What did he say? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he has risen. Christians, we must move past the endless memorial stones because our Lord is not a dead memory. Our Lord is not absent. Christ is not a sentiment, a memory, or a wish upon a star. Christ is living. He is a living high priest, daily interceding for us, advocating for us, presenting our needs in the throne room of heaven. And our future is guaranteed. The resurrection of Christ punctured through the wall, separating this world from the next. And a takeover began. Eternity is invading. The king's forces have already arrived on the shore and a new beginning has dawned. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might be preeminent, supreme. Ancient gates were flung over at the resurrection. The ladder touched down on earth and heaven is stepping through, all because of the decisive work of the son. He is the firstborn from the dead and with many to follow. Our master's resurrection guarantees our resurrection. Death's defenses lie shattered and the night is quickly passing. The dead begin to move and he is at the door. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. In the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet, all will be made new. The perishable bodies of the saints, the disease-ridden, the decay-laden, the crippled, the weak, will all be swallowed up by life itself. The earthly realm and the heavenly will mingle and the new creation will brim with God, angels and men. The empty tomb signals the nearness of the divine takeover. The decisive domino has fallen and we are united with him both in his death and in his resurrection. You might be thinking this, this word united, thinking I, I've got no good reference for that. I don't know where to look in my, in my experience for understanding united with God. How do I personally experience a union with Christ, even in his death or resurrection? Friends, the Bible has an answer. We experience unity with Jesus by faith. Faith in Jesus. See, this is how it works. The Holy Spirit leads us to embrace Jesus through faith. We embrace Jesus as Savior and Lord. We declare him the treasurer of our lives. And the Holy Spirit establishes, births a union with us in Christ. Paul wrote to the early church in Rome, if the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. Let me read that again. If the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he God, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal body. So if Christ is in you now, if the risen Christ is dwelling in you now, you will one day be raised from the dead. This tidal wave of resurrection will wash over the graveyards and spill over all creation. The grass will sparkle green. The waters will run free. The oceans will pulse with life. Birds will sing new songs from the treetops. All creation, it says in Romans 8, will be set free from its bondage to corruption and decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The knowledge of the glory of Jesus will cover the world as water covers the seas. It is epically huge. 
It is not a blinding afterthought to the cross. This day, this event, not an afterthought, it's everything. I compare it almost to like a plastic plant. The, the resurrection is not a plastic plant that sits in the corner of the room with no smell, no real beauty, maybe just a mocked beauty of something else, no actual function. No, if Christ had not been raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. Paul rails on this in, in 1 Corinthians 15. If we have hope in this life only, we're the pity of the earth. Paul was fully convinced that Jesus is risen. Jesus is alive and that it matters more than any other piece of information that we might glean through our entire lives. So much so that if Christians are proven to be wrong, then we should be pitied by everyone. Pity by everyone. But actually, if true, it's true. The resurrection means we are securely forgiven. His living presence with us is ensured. And our eternal future is guaranteed. John Piper once preached this. He said, I want to declare loud and clear this morning that the meaning of Easter is that God is in the business of clearing this world of heartbreak. The meaning of an empty tomb or the opening of a closed tomb is that God has begun a campaign with Jesus Christ to open a million doors of hope to people who trust him. I love that. The resurrection decisively begins the process of clearing this world of heartbreak. Finally and forever, he is the beginning. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we celebrate you. We engage with the poignancy of the cross, but we celebrate with joy and a freedom and a glistening life and exuberance, the resurrection of Jesus that brings us life to the full, that guarantees our forgiveness, that, that enables us to experience your presence each day, that secures our eternal hope. Lord, let us not fall into confusion on this incredible event but be alive to it, be vibrant to it, be so engaged with it. So engaged with that sense of you as our great high priest at the right hand of the father, advocating for our needs. Our big brother who is alive, who was and is and is to come. Lord God, fan us into flame. Fill us with your spirit once more. And Lord, I pray for those, those friends who I don't yet know who, who engage with us through Facebook and YouTube. Those that are maybe listening today, maybe hearing about the resurrection for the first time or the, or the hundredth time. Lord, I pray that you would meet with them. Lord, I pray that you would lead them into greater revelation, greater awareness. Lord, I pray for those that feel like they are far away from you. Lord, I pray for that moment where the Holy Spirit brings them right on in close to embrace you in faith. Lord, I pray for that, that new birth of faith and life that comes only through you and through your death and resurrection. Thank you, Lord.